bentos. Uh, gee. Bentos and uh, black beans, yeah. kidney beans. Working on number 10. We had a nice conference right here last week. Well, it's indeed a pleasure uh, to come here and uh, not run up. And uh, worry about if anyone's here, anyone's there, came in, ate lunch with my friends, came in. Doesn't get any better than this. I like to talk to farmers, to talk with farmers. There's many of you, well, <coughs> I was going to say many of you with many years more experience than me, but I'm getting up there, so at least I got that going for me, but uh, uh, if you uh, want to share your opinion and disagree with me on anything, that's fine. Some of this stuff is uh, is not devoted to you folks that whose hair is the same color as mine, or n not to get specific if your hair is missing, like some other people, <laughs> but there's just some things, and as my father used to say, uh, I'm going to be a smart old man because I'm beginning to pick up the little things already. And uh, been in this business for 39 and a half years, and uh, I'm totally committed to uh, to pasture, but I don't obsess on it. <laughs> and the reason is, uh, this is the hardest concept for me to understand when I started in extension. Uh, you know, as I've been out of been out of college, the Southwest was just a little army, a little this and that, and the other thing. And I just thought everybody was in this for the money. That was not the case. So if I'm pushing uh, a program with one idea in mind and the farmer's got a different idea in mind, you can see where that that's going to work. Now these comments, these comments are uh, based on this goal, to arrive at the market with an animal with a cost per pound of production occurred, but it's a lot more the most profitable than an animal of uh, race, period. So, but my question is, are you driven, are you driven by the uh, profit motive? I don't care. So, for one, a couple of reasons, a lot of people uh, uh, run their farm to uh, keep the brush down and graze cattle and sheep and goats, and other people do it to make a little jingle, other people do it to be healthy. That's more to be healthy, that's fine. And a lot of people want to keep the farming tradition going. So, I think it changes how you look at your risk. Well, I know it does. It changes how you look at your risk. Uh, upper scale product or land meat falls into that. Each of us in here, each of us in here, risk awareness and a different risk tolerance. Now, not all of them are driven by the extreme of being highly leveraged, highly in debt, and all of that, because we know that livestock enterprises, especially if we're selling commodities, uh, the, the margins are pretty slim. We've enjoyed these high-priced cattle. I sold lambs last year, not this year. I didn't understand why lambs were two dollars a head last year, and a little more than half of that this year. But we took. But Phil Osborne was talking about this. He said we've never seen more money in agriculture than we see now. But we not necessarily have we seen more profit in agriculture. <laughs> That's not been the case. We're just high rollers right now. Lots and lots of money. But the extreme is heavily leveraged, you know, uh, you owe so much money on the, the farm and the operation and all that, that you know, the, the bankers become a real partner of yours, down to being uh, self-insured, which is a mindset based on the resources you have, or uh, just no debt, no worries. But uh, you got to determine uh, your strategy, and it, and again, it goes back to what are your goals, what do you want to what do you want to see happen? Uh, I think all of us in West Virginia evolved, and this is generations before us, but we, we came from a uh, subsistence farm uh, situation. We uh, found ourselves uh, uh, growing food and then bartering some and then being able to sell extra and as, as we learned to produce and 
when we discovered uh, uh, fertilizer, especially nitrogen fertilizer, there was even more to sell. So we've sort of evolved into this, but we've never been great entrepreneurs in, in West Virginia and Appalachia. That's good to see. Appalachian Grazing Conference, and there's no difference. So I think sometimes when we go into these objects, the, the these potential at this, we're pretty, put it that way, uh, goals in place, and uh, not so serious expectations in that demand. You know, uh, do well. I taught uh, I have 20 years at the county agent in Preston County. Then I came to Morgan the County, the, uh, ex the state extension. The body frame. And Certainly a show ring influence, but also the Midwestern land, the so I don't land, the uh, farm management uh, uh, risk and genetic disappointment. So and so you know, it all boils down to the manager. I lean them on and the top. I've got and they're going probably 20 textbooks, and, and I teach them a group or, or, or whatever it is. But someplace in the first or second paragraph, it says the manager's job is to execute the plan. If we don't have a plan, we don't have anything to implement. We don't know we're getting there. If we don't have a plan at the end of the year, we don't know if we've made any progress toward that. And I keep harping on that, but it's really important to keep that, that aspect in mind. So if, if the operation doesn't have a plan, how in the world do you manage to hoard anything? And if you don't keep records, how do you know where you've been? So the kinds of risks that, that we face on our farms are performance risk. Then we have health risk, which certainly affects performance, the bottom line. Genetic, liability, certainly predation. We have marketing risk, and price risk. Here's the thing. These, are, I, are, these things, you just don't just uh, pick something here, pick something um, there. there with it, they fall and inquire. Talk about, you know, there's some of us that are better managers than others, but management requires time. Somebody's got to, somebody's got to get a hold of those, keep records, get a hold of them, read them. If you don't, if you can't, not putting on the fat, and there's not a lot there. But you've got to keep some some records. So you you talk about that for the maybe or maybe not with the risk management plan, couple, and so uh, we're really looking at uh, your production plan. Does is your production plan in any way so, um, if we're looking uh, farm frame operation you've got? My little uh, bio there includes wheat and dry beans now. And I live in Preston County. We've got a good bit of open ground in the county, a lot of open ground in, in Preston County, and I'm, I'm blessed with, with some of it. But there's a couple things about that. I, I'm into the local uh, food thing big time, and, you know, Americans per capita spent $4,600 per capita on food last year, $4,600. A little old dinky state like uh, West Virginia with a population of 1.8 million spent $7.2 billion on food just last year. We need to think about that and how, how it plugs in. But so we're going to assume that we're going to six months. Go ahead and plant back So if there's smaller needs, we may have 2.6 pounds of, of feed. Up farm 82 days or so. I'll preface it with feed lot. 20 years of the county. Of two people came, two types of people, I mean beginners, came into the office. Some of them came in and they, by golly, wanted to raise such and such, whatever it was, no matter what. Well, I mean, it's, it's anyone's right, but the questions were, weren't asking is they had a piece of ground. What could they do with it? The other bunch would come in. I bought a farm and so and so. What can I do with it? Well, both of them needed some, some help, but you know, taking a look at your farm and the opportunity that you have and then some, the, the ability to pick up some land around there has a lot to do with uh, You put with in a value of dollar fifty a pound for land? That's an important thing to, uh, to keep in mind, kind of matching what your farm offers as you develop your plan, as you develop your risk plan. So we'll run through some of these uh, uh, risk things, and, and if uh, you're past that, I'll talk about personal risk. I talk about this all the time. And when we talk about risk, it doesn't make any difference if your operations works. And I know we, you, you come to the grazing conference not to hear about 
with that effort, it would have been crazy, but I was asked to talk about risk management, and I can't think of things that are more important than that. But in there. It just gives you a thing to kind of give you a little indigestion on the way home. But uh, uh, do you have a will? You talk about one single thing that can screw up an operation because we're all in this business to to take this operation to the next generation and give them an operation that, uh, to continue. And they're, they're that's landing our, right our goal. Is. So do you have a will? And for heaven's sake, do you have an uh, advanced directive? The largest brand news may not have dealt with that. Do that on all fours. And their family's wealth risk to keep someone alive when they're in a vacant state with no one. You can't afford to do it, and no one in that state would want to be that way. But maybe someone does, but you need to find somebody. Some sort of a plan for generations. Similar diet, let's say, You've got to have it. You've got to have it. Down and right, now that, but stuff but goes. All three of these things are tied together. Does that keep because you should have a will. Where should the market? will be? We ought to have a copy of it at, uh, in your safety deposit box, but not if you don't have the next year, the uh, the following generation, your sons or daughters, uh, with the same access to that uh, safety deposit box as your wills in, it takes a court order to open it upon your death. Well, so you, you want to think about that. In that will, when you're young, about who's going to care for the kids and that sort of thing, and get older, then it's really a matter of what you're looking at now and you're looking at that transition is going to be. But it's a draw a box. You talk to people about that. And the most economy. important people to talk about is your kids. What do they think? I think I talked to clear across the state five or six years ago. Fiber. Fiber is a lot. He came up and we were talking about estate planning. And he said, well, I'll tell you. It's not going to do well on a forage-based system. You have to feed it a nutrient-rich diet, diet, which can feed it grain and nuts. I can do something like this, and I can. I think you're absolutely visionary because sure as God made little green apples, they will. What can you do about it? Be sure to that. It's just too emotional. It's not about the money. It's about the emotion. So get all this stuff put together. It doesn't. It's not necessarily fun, but when people have time to think and get away from that, we can look at and respond. And stuff, uh, it's funny how those come down. My youngest daughter is loves the farm probably more than my other two but has less interest in, in farming. But she has some, some of the most clever ideas and talk about our farm and, and how we're going to do that. And so it's important that the kids weigh in. Another risk thing, income tax management. We don't have time to talk about income tax management. I think as far as farm management, it's my favorite topic. But I'll spare you that, except to say a couple things. Talk that. One of them is, if you're keeping records, that it may come out of a land trust, a, a home test, more difficult out of your performance test with your utility and people, and if you're you in the involved in the aggressive here, so you keep your record. You, increase time to squash you do a coordinated financial statement at the end. And improving disease resistance. We have foot rot issues, parasites. You just see how much equity you've built without the real estate. Resistance to now, when you're trying to blow your, your banker away, you put your real estate in, and of course, you're the new best friend because these farms are doing so much money. And you do build equity in those farms. You lock a price in in 1985, and look what it's worth today. But you take that out so you have a real idea. A lot of times I'm even starting to get gets to income tax management. Why? Because there are so many opportunities to get less Are they raising money? To work those taxes to your advantage. Health benchmark comes to mind. Marketing and financial. If you keep uh, records. Like birth weight, weaning weight, yearling weight, weight. Take them into another year. So now you can find out you're going to know if you've made any money. Well, you have all options there. You can prepay expenses, reduce your tax liability. That is important. That's how you uh, manage risk on the farm. And my favorite above all is spousal employment. We don't make much money on these farms. And uh, I mean, you're going to go home and say, I think he's in there cheap. I don't know how much money we don't make. But I'm not realistic. But I'm telling you. Uh, the ability for a Schedule F filer 
to employ his or her wife, or his or her spouse, because 33% of the farms in West Virginia are managed by women. These women would hire their husband and the, you the other way. Were exposed. And that's on the farm. More important because you can say, oh, I had a Record, good job description and some things, but you can pull money out of that farm operation to give to that spouse to pay that spouse for work. I mean, you pay the neighbor kid to throw up hay and you pay another neighbor to fix fence or whatever that is. Well, hire the spouse. The spouse can pull that money out of that operation and then uh, use that for health insurance. I know everyone's sitting down, thank God, because I'm going to say things that farmers never talk about the farm paying for. Retirement plans, vacations, building onto the house, that's the thing that that spouse can do with that, that money. Now, you can only hire your spouse, so you can rest assured that job interview is probably a little dicey. But anyway, those are the, you know, it goes like, well, Let the lamp goes off again. okay. Uh, we both hold off farm jobs. So we're not sure. Maybe for the calves are out, you put them in. Produce an animal that can do that or I'll buy it. Look at your Break little mortgage. Break two. Your percentages. Do you want to get below 10%? And prepare me a time to have a That's all you have to do, you see. Anyway, so, uh, but you know, are we partners in a, a farm family and all the kids work? But take advantage of that. But those are some, those are some personal risk things that can really reduce the risk in your operation. Don't let the operation manage you. Set a plan and manage it. I'll guarantee you one thing. This grazing conference is way ahead of old because we had to get rid of them before Huge. they became obsolete. So they didn't. That's the same they with the small farm operation. You and I can agree. Here we are, 10 years. Never have we seen, I watched RFDTV yesterday morning. Wheat's backed off a little bit, down about seven and a half. Corn's 780, something like that. I'm telling you, these sustained start and some hay. are going to result in a paradigm shift yeah, for both yeah, the sheep and cattle business. Now, we have to learn how to sustain performance with grass and less feed. Starter pellets, I'm in the calf pool. Starter pellets, $435 a, a ton. Holy smokes. Then my buck got out. I was joking and and uh, talking to two or three hundred farmers and of course get home on Sunday night and my bucks had been out since I left Friday morning so we had a little surprise set of lambs and so I said to my partner, I said, this ain't going to work. I said, we're going to have to get them a treat or something. That's perfect. Now, lamb pellets right now, $500. What kind of an idiot would lamb this time of the year? You can't do it. You can't unless you've got a whale of, of uh, mark. The lamb market is all over the place. We can't do prices. It's very hard to justify these kinds of prices when we have cattle that can beat cattle and sheep and pasture. And pasture. So this is exactly right. I wish I'd come up with this, but sustained corn prices will result in a paradigm shift for both the sheep and cattle business. Amen, amen. That's lower. The single... Most important thing we can do, and this is so easy to say at a grazing conference, is increase the number of grazing. Well, whatever it might be there. Snowed in Terra Alta, the, the uh, top of the mountain, 2,800 to 50 feet is where we farm. And we had our first snow covered up on with that superstorm Sandy on October 28th or 9th, whatever that was. We've seen the ground a couple of times since then, but not very much of it. Of course, we're under 18 inches of snow right now. So I keep just wham. At 10 to 12, 14 on your age. Look at this. Well, that's just baloney. Um, we have I can't this year. But the years that I can, if my hay uh, storage is in the way that it should be, my hay's out of the weather, and I can feed what I saved last year when it was open. I can feed this year. My friend in uh, Greenbrier County, John McCutcheon, He's just about this far from not feeding any uh, hay at all. Feeds so little that he can buy his hay. So you don't do this. And th this is a this is a, a trait that I have. You know, somebody's feeding me uh, harvested hay 35 days or something. I'm more like 150 days. And I don't like that because that's the most expensive part. 
of a cow budget, most expensive part of a U budget. So you want to pay attention to coming into the local the number of grazing days. Those of you with grazing mean animals looking at the year October uh, uh, 28th. Well, then I'll I'll have to change my way. We're going to find ways to increase the number of days that we graze and decrease the number of days. You've got to figure out what it costs you to make hay. Maybe if you really took a look at that, <laughs> maybe you'd be a little more excited about increasing the number of grazing days. Man, I'm telling you, it's really expensive. I don't think anybody can disagree with that. Here's what I learned. This is, I've got a mowing machine, and of course I had a square baler until I just got too old and, well, and the kids all left. But anyway, so we're into, we made uh, round bales, and then it took forever, and it would get them out together, and then, you know, you'd bale all day, then you couldn't get the, anyway, it goes on and on and on. Well, I'm lucky enough to have some people around that have balers, and, and they cost them enough that they want to, uh, they want to uh, do custom work. So uh, I've got two or three neighbors that got big square balers. I haven't hooked to that, well, that round baler. I, I mm. <laughs> talked to Bill King seven or eight years ago, maybe ten, and said, I'd like to trade a baler and see what you got in Vermeer. And he said, uh, what kind you got? And he said, it's a Vicon. He said, let's just talk about a straight edge tape. You see what I'm saying? I don't have a yeah. round tape. At least I didn't. So what we're doing now is it, I'm paying someone to bale the hay. So but I drive to Morgan County here from Whitwood City to have someone bale hay. Well, I think that I'm in minority. Most of us have a complete, have a complete uh, hay making uh, string. Oh, we love it. I'm telling you, when we're on that tractor, it's good times. Now, I've finally graduated. I'm 63 years old. I've got a nice air-conditioned tractor and XM radio and air conditioned Man, we let her roll. I enjoy it. I don't make any money now on that, but, but it was hard for me to make that decision. But we do it now. We're saving money because that baler, holy smoke, that baler costs more than all my equipment put together. I couldn't, I couldn't, he bailed that hay for us for less than the interest on that machine, flat out. And it's funny, of course, they, they uh, you know, when you're asking, are these the kind of questions you're asking? So often, Jeff. I mean, so often. He's when we buy sheep and we're buying our genetics. And I called my friend. Oh, the owner said it's the best one. Good hay. Yeah. Take pride in their hay. Heard that about, hey, the best yeah. ram out of my go right. sheep. I need, I need to find that. I'm going to start raking now. He said, I'll give you an hour and a half and I'll be out. And I've got a or you ask him nine, wheel, nine or ten wheel rake. Okay. I was raking for all I was raking. How many miles? I'm 45 minutes now. Here comes yeah, Rob. Okay. What options? I know now what a rabbit field is. options are out there. You're making an informed so decision. You grab there and that, that shad is coming down. Because for the last third of that hay rake, and I'm going like this, because he's eating me up. Well, the bottom line is not how fast you can bail hay. But the minute I was done, normally I'm done raking for you. Check them with EPDs or EDDs or special kind of grooming, and they'll do a great job. Uh, my bailing bill was, I don't know, let's say 45 pounds. Well, whatever your bailing bill is, EPDs. Now, now I just think you take that and dozen rods and you get a second to make it. This is just for that we don't cooperate, we don't make it. What we, uh, we do is I call and I said, uh, if I were to mow 25 or 30 acres, can you get a pair of my little can't bear this one? So I just sit there and you feel like a real nitwit. Everyone else makes a you know. Say, I'm, I'm for the night, honey. You know, that kind of stuff. It never works. You always feel like an underachiever. But you do it. Then the next time you get in. So we had to learn to do that. I saw it when I was a, a kid. Dwight Gibson in Cranesville had the first little square bale I ever saw. We had to rely on him to come and bail. Of course, you know, so it's always a toss-up between how good your hay is and, and all that. But that's what we've done. That's what managers do. Great. Um, Another thing thing it doesn't have to be the whole grain. That we've got to do it in the group. You know, you know, you know what it costs us to produce a pound. You're raising Sussex. Uh, Are you this is in your uh, this is in your handout. It's also on our uh, on our web page, Small Farm Center. What's it in? The how does this is, you just plug in some numbers, or if you're a single enterprise, 
It's not a single enterprise. Take your Schedule F. If all you've got is cows and calves, put that in there, divide uh, that uh, your gross sales, see if you've made any money or your gross, uh, or your gross expenses, see what your cash you can work with and go from there. And if you keep your income tax, you can do that for the preceding 10 years. And you're requ required by law to uh, keep them for three years. Anyway, I don't know what they do. Sneak around up there. I want to see what you do. Okay. Anyway, it's, but think about that. So you compare it to, well, it's clear out in left field on your cost per pound of uh, production. You can compare it to anybody. But as a rule, the only person you're really comparing that to is yourself. What did you do last year? You know, well, how have things changed? Why did they go up? That's the sort of thing that you that you want to do. There's uh, that thing has uh, a page. Now this isn't a tax document because you know you pull your bull and stuff out of there when if you've already uh, if you've already uh, taken your bull or, or uh, depreciated your bull. Thanks off the uh, off of that. You know that you keep your accounting a little different. But for this, it gives you a real idea of uh, where you are. You can uh, begin to measure uh, how much uh, protein, protein, blah, whatever you want to do that there. But to do that, that really helps you uh, know where you are, and that's, that's important. For feeders, I don't know how many people turn cattle out. All I'm going to say about that is go back to almost the conclusion. The eye of the master fattens the calf. Now, you can, I work with people, and I sell a, a few steers in, in the spring to people, turning them out, and... They've drunk the, the uh, pasture Kool-Aid. Don't you think, oh, gee, many Christmas, they've got it down. But they don't know where they are. Now, I'd like to think I'm selling them cattle that can, can work for them. But the first thing I always go is, what are those calves going to cost? I saw them bring such and such at the stockyard. Now, there you go. Was it a single? Was it a group of good calves? What are you talking about? Do you know what you're talking about? I'll tell you one thing right now. Healthy cattle, cattle that have the breeding, uh, can, uh, you know, breeding meaning with the right genetics, they can give you a profitable conversion of grass into meat. You should go find cattle. What they found wasn't really surprising. The high lambs grew faster. Fewer days. Greater did uh, this is help you buying this time? She, she kept me in a budget. Well, that's good. You need to be you need to be that way. But you can't. Is there anyone here farm service agency? I'll tell. Well, if you are, they were all gone today. But when I was in the uh, when I was a county agent, a lot of people or we were still milking cows in Preston County. And so these guys would borrow money to to get in the dairy business, and then they'd, they'd set a a uh, Ceiling on what they could spend for cash. Same thing with beef cattle. By golly, there was always somebody who had cash. What did they start with? They started behind the, the eight ball from the get go. So it's real important so what you're doing at the yard. Catch them from the work with somebody that can. Don't what's their value? And what's the value of their offspring in their flock? That's hard to measure. Them could utilize off the calves from the sale before. Work with somebody. Get with your county agent. Get with your neighbor that, that works. Word about neighbors. We love them. Same thing with taxing. Just because somebody is getting, you know, uh, doing something wrong with taxes and not getting caught doesn't make it right. And just because your neighbor appears to be uh, making money doing something does not necessarily mean that he's making money doing something. Because uh, management can be quiet doesn't necessarily have to be sustainable. So you, you really want to think about that and buy the very best that you can. An old friend of mine used to say, uh, uh, you always buy the highest quality cattle you can afford. If we can all get cattle to turn out, you know, some people buy the data is now being run with the U.S. dorset feeder data. So I'm getting cross blocking data. So if I send them into your flock and you're also on it, I can see how my ram performs in your flock and get feedback to it. Then don't waste your money doing that. Get someone to help you. Computerized genetic and production of sheep you know, based on performance. Talk about the rest of the price. Breeding value. Same old thing. Here's the uh, 
on your yearlings. That's well, I have uh, an open work that for Max. And, uh, so I have a definition of worksheet. It's an uh, individual animal and a benchmark to which the animal is due. That address. But the only thing I want to say about this is see what this stuff costs. See what different uh, rations do. Uh, that particular uh, worksheet, I've got eight or ten versions. So you can go ahead and play with these things and, and see the one. We're going to start with this bill. That's the lowest at one that says the coach eating uh, fee and uh, the base to which it's being prepared. So if, if it was my just block EDD, that'd be five pounds. Now if you think you're going to call me, 698-707, I'd rather do that as you leave a message in the office. But we'll work through this thing, whatever you guys need. But you want to take a real look at what you've, uh, what you've gotten yourself into here so that you have a real idea of whether or not you've made any money. Any shepherds in here? Yeah. Well, two of us in here. I always have to get my, my brother. Uh, here's here's the, the deal on uh, sheep and goats. Any goats in here? All the relatives are now gone. The yeah. things you have to do to make to manage your risk grazing uh, goats and sheep. You have to manage predators. You have to. Uh, dogs, um, I feel in the budget if you want to see one, they're not. It's a powerful tool. It's not, it's not something everybody needs to be using. Goats, however, <laughs> you should get us into the can't directly measure the well, that technology is about 8,000 so years old. Guard animals have been around for a long time. Dogs, of course, they've got some pressure problems. Good donkeys work great. None of it works if you don't have sense, period. Just just provide for that, and the goat folks can uh, share that. I've got some brush that I want to... Uh, we were on land plans of 2,000, uh, as, as I mentioned. It's this long to figure out that not everyone raises goats the same way, because I could keep my sheep in not the goats. The goat Logan wire. We are well, those are bad goats. Yeah, but anyway, so uh, uh, if you don't if you don't uh, commit to a fencing program, the rest of the stuff just a waste of time. You've got a conviction score and uh, we don't want that to happen. Uh, ewes and goats. You've got to. And if they're not agreeing for one reason or another to your management, you've got to sell them. I mean, you can kick yourself for a while. Lambs, you've got to pick ewes. Ewes, that wool begins to break on you. They've got to go. And then maternal weaning weight. And this is a combination of known 40 years ago. Of the year. And we're also looking at, we do ultrasound and preliminary you can keep reps. Your ewes. And then we're not selecting for it. We're just kind of watching the back of that thing. That'll make all the difference in the world. And I don't care. You can read sheep and goat books to the cows come so home. Or the ewes come home. Started, um, you don't accomplish this. Started in 2000, around 2000. Right. I don't grow and harvest the kind of feed that they need. You're wasting your time. I don't get to put horse hay, old cow hay, put in the sheep and ewes, and, and, and you can try to supplement unless you just feed the daylights out of them. They're not going to perform. And I think the key, or my last key, is keep the ewes fat and give them good hay. Healthy ewes have healthy lambs, and healthy lambs perform. It's that simple. Well, what do I have? So, what happened? Then we get down to the liability side of this. You can at this point we legal using Virginia has guidelines for legal fences, five strands, wasn't wires, electric wires accepted. That's all well and good, but trust me, folks, if you're cow, post weaning weight, somebody like I said we're watching birth weight and we're watching it's an old uh, trick and. Up in Preston, so that's got an old jumper down there. Continue. If I have to, I'll start put selection pressure. You'll pay to get the jumper fixed up. That happens more than you'd ever dream of. It surprised me. But anyway, I don't care how legal your fence is. The state law says you've got to keep your stuff at home. So if they get out, you're liable. Now, the good news is your insurance company covers you on all that. That's not a problem, but you have to check with them. Liability insurance. You can't live on a farm without a farm home policy. Bottom line. And everyone goes, ah, we all know that. But you don't know that unless you've read that and then you send a letter to your 
to your agent and said, I'm doing this, this, and this. Uh, selecting four animals and you. The letter back says, I see that you're doing this, this, and this, and you're covered with a team of whatever. If you don't have that liability covered in there, you're asking for it. Product liability, you know, you can hide forever, but if you've taken that next step and you're selling meat uh, and you don't have product liability and your banker hears about it, they're going to be unhappy. That and your family will too when you get Please your family sued and away you go. So product liability, it's real simple. You don't just give your agent a call. You document. You write your agent a letter. Say to him or her what you're doing, what you want to do, and am I covered and to what degree? And then they'll respond because you want to hold on to that. Partnerships. <coughs> There's a little trait called inferred liability. So we're sitting here, and I'm about to jump on the cast pool. So I'm sitting there. Uh, Tom takes his calves to a cast pool. And we have a wonderful relationship, and, and everything's just, you know, uh, just the way neighbors operate. Well, if one of us uh, says, let's buy feed, and then... I'll bring it back, I'll, I'll do the trucking this time, and then you get back up and get half the load, then the next time you are in first Other peer and if your partner, because none of us would ever do that, but if your partner is doing this, your inferred partner, stops at the uh, bar on the way back and gets liquored up and drives in the side of the school bus, all of a sudden you're implicated in this. And that is an important thing to keep in mind. So the thing about it is, there's, you know, as they say, there's an app for that. There certainly is. It's called a parental privacy stalker. So should everyone be performance testing? Is there anybody else lined up with them? We have to. Cooperative, cooperative, limits, reliability. Do you realize that there are strong pool to produce the energy security of stock? Period. Can they get right? They get uh, direct uh, insurance, and you guys are covered. You walk away from this. Now, if you've sold someone a product that, that makes them sick, and they trace that back, big numbers of kilograms, one of this other stuff. Out. So, if we're looking at possible, we have this the prices of a buck twenty and pounds. They've put so much money in my pocket. We've sold our calves. I know twelve, fifteen cents more than they would have brought any place. I mean, it's a different product. You know, we start them and see those high price pellets and stuff. That's because I'm not a good farmer. A lot of our people in the pool go out on grass with them. But everything's fine. And then that day goes when we agree on those calves at at a dollar six, and the calves every place else bought a dollar twenty six. Then what happens? Or the trailer, you know, uh, wrecks, and it just goes on and on. We're just we're just operating without nets right now, without uh, without for filling for this for thing. So th that's just a little something. It's it's no big deal to do this. We've got lots of people that can help you form uh, cooperatives. It's really simple now. There's lots of templates out there to make it work, but it it allows you. First of all, when you do that, uh, you need equipment to. Uh, to do whatever you're going to do with those cattle as a group, a cooperative can borrow money and you're not, you know, the cooperative can borrow money. So it's just something you want to think about. Predation, you have to have a predation plan. Uh, I said it before, it's a cheat. You know, uh, there's got to be an integrated plan. You can't be just, uh, and we see it with sheep all the time. You know, we found fewer than 30,000 ewes. One time, the state had nine hundred. Paid two hundred dollars for that bugger. Now I'm going to send him to auction because he did. They're worth probably more goats now than they are sheep. It's just you know without people, you know, some of these guys. It's just, but think about this. And what happens is, no plan, no way to deal with it, and it is disheartening. Well, dogs, coyotes, bears, whatever it is, get into the uh, on your sheep, and you're just whipped. And you're whipped because you didn't have a plan, you didn't have sense, you haven't dealt with this. You've got to consider these things, and if you want to stay in, you can make make money doing that. But you can't just be victimized. This sounds like a red dot. Marketing risk. This is what it's all about. Probably what I should have started, uh, come here to talk about. But 
All of us, I don't know how many uh, big operators we have. Here. I've got 50 plus cows here. Like, you know, you can't, you, you can't uh, cut out there and fill it. Like that, you know, and people say, I don't want to pay more than $100 yeah. or $200 for a ram. And I get that all the time. A cool deal, and that's all. Ship land, keep the cows on. Maybe cooperatively uh, uh, send them to uh, a market or cooperatively feed. But we need to be sure that we've got enough people uh, working with us, have enough cattle that, and I'll borrow the sports analogy, but so we can play big. All of us little guys need to work together. Uh, this is my favorite one right now. If you can add value, reduce risk by selling uh, beef, lamb, or, or uh, kids as a, uh, meat if you're a manufacturing commodity. And you're selling commodities, so what'd you get? You're selling meat to set that price. Now, we all un understand that we can't expect a society to reward us for inefficient operations. But there's nobody out there that's selling this that's not hitting people straight up and say, it just costs me. Right now, it just costs me. And so my product is up. Typical one. I'm a Walbrand an agent in, uh, uh, in Mason County as his farmer selling to the schools. Uh, everyone said, oh, you can't sell to the schools. Well, you can. The school wants it. The farmers want it. Uh, he sold 11 or 12 cattle so far to the Mason County schools. There's 4,300 students there. We had one meal. We fed one meal of them with local food, and it added $10,000. One meal back into the local economy. One meal, and we're just letting it go away. They're kind of so Super man, he did. Uh, he's got he's got these farmers now. It's eleven or twelve, and, now. and they are. He the deal he makes with his farmers now they're not grass fed, but that are that are hard feeding those cattle. He says, let's take the price that they're worth today, and add one hundred dollars to it, or ten percent, whichever is greater, and then we'll do all of our marketing from there, and it's working for him. So he's using a local market. They've got their liability insurance. Product. The uh, calf and yearling partnerships, I've never understood. I talked to a lady uh, at this, the small farm conference last week who she sells, last year she sold 89 cattle uh, as uh, in chunks as beef, 89. And uh, she was talking about how nice it would be to have a calf yearling deal where where she wouldn't buy the calf, she would share that uh, uh, that profit with the folks that had the calf. And, and think about that for someone that's, that's uh, well, she has an interesting operation. She doesn't Sometimes we did control cattle the way they did wow. 75 years ago or three years ago. But uh, anyway, she's making that work. But I've never understood why they didn't have breeders, people that sell herd bulls, to try to to uh, work with the people that buy their bulls to sell their calves to them. So anyway, but herd responsibility and profit potential is must. You just, uh, you've got to, to learn to work together. Ken, I'd better hurry up. I talk too much. Price risk, as my youngest daughter said, I wish Pop would get a real job because all he does is stand around and talk about it. Uh, price risk, this is so basic and so often overlooked. You've got to know what the prices are. I mean, the days uh, of a buyer coming to your farm and buying a calf and knocking it in the head and putting it on a sled and dragging it out and you taking the price, those days are gone. You know, we all hear this, well, those boys, they sold or cold. I have found truthfully that we had selected for RR for a while, but some of my grossiers and Like Marcella Shell, hell, we didn't know it was even down there, let alone what it was worth. But you know what I'm saying? There, there's controversy on that. Some countries, like England, they do. It is. What I worked really hard to get this in the in the states. I farmer a guy at Sad Heart in Iowa State, and he came to West Virginia, and he and Billy Burke and me and a couple others drove around all over the states, saying to people to be. Response to it. What?
what is the single thing that bothers you the most? Well, I was sure that they'd say, if I could ensure that I would get performance with my grass, because we're a grass state, I thought that's what I would hear. Not one person, you would have thought that they rehearsed it. They all wanted price insurance. They all wanted to make sure that they could protect the price. So, livestock risk protection, it's a long story how we got it here, but anyway, I got LRP here, and that insures against unexpected drops in cattle prices. You have to know that our prices are driven by what happens in 13 major cattle states, and it's amazing how many cattle trade out there. And we think, well, what happens? Who cares what happens out there? Because what happens out there drives exactly what happens in the east. Now, it's not to the penny because who knows? And it's not as great in the spring because we all get grass fever in Appalachia in the spring. We get cattle to turn out. We, we bid to unrealistic expectations. And, so. and if the performance is right, we still get along somehow. But it ensures against an unexpected drop. It's single peril. Um, but it was first down to stop at some hand. Someone steals your cattle or the truck runs over or lightning hits the barn or whatever it is. Or if they can, they just farmers come by from different posted levels. Uh, I'm sure 90, 70, 95% of that. Disease resistance, there's a, there's a pest sure. foot rot resistance right now that there's some interest. I know one in Canada who's using that right now. There's a cold tolerance gene available. Uh, they submit a one time application, and each, uh, then each group of cattle uh, from one to uh, 1,000, the annual limit's 2,000 head. And yes, I've got my yearlings covered right now for $1.58. Coverage is available for steers, heifers, and so forth, even Brahmin cattle. Uh, there's the uh, places to get online, and then we'll jump on there if you can get me going on that, and I want to show you. There's those 12 states. I had a little uh, star slippage there, but you can see here's, here's West Virginia, and there are those states. And so, so what's going on here? Well, that's where the cattle country is. Now, you get onto that website, and there's a couple other deals, but you're going to pull up right here, and uh, this, how this works is you're going to, A, develop a good relationship with your crop insurance agent, and yep, we're talking crop insurance, and nope, there's not very many of them in West Virginia. I'm, I, there's also one for lamb, LRP lamb, and no one in West Virginia sells LRP lamb, but LRP cattle, there's about three or four guys, and there's five. And you've got to contact them. There's an agent locator, the uh, risk management agent that will chastise me severely for calling one by name. But so you get the agent locator, and then you can look for Steve Grant and Winchester works for Farm Credit. Our species cattle. Tom Mathias and Ed Big Jones and the damage it does. Is that That's east in the South Branch Valley? That's Lloyd. And uh, well, but you can if you turn this around, I'll show you real quick. Because <coughs> remember I said to market, you've got to know what things are worth. Now everybody, why you, why you insure is your business. But it's important to, if you're trying to protect the price of your, uh, your cattle, then you'll get on the, that website that I showed you there, and now we're there. This is live. So here's the LRP coverage rates. Now there's LGM, and that's uh, livestock gross margin, and that's basically for feedlots. LRP covers uh, cattle, you know, calves and yearlings. So you get on there. Come here, buddy. Come on, buddy. Yeah. Man, that's story of my life. Oh. I'm not. I've been kicked out of better places than that. What? Okay. Well, see you right there, buddy. Wow. Okay, so I punched that deal for, for LRP, and this is the effective date. Uh, is that today or is that today? 
yesterday. Okay, because they don't do business on, on uh, Saturdays and Sundays. Okay, so they're going to do six a day. This is silly. They put those states there. I don't know why. I guess it's just to track because it's the same program completely, but I always like to know that West Virginia plugged in. <laughs> anyway, so there's West Virginia. Next. Then here's the commodity. If you're doing feeder cattle, then uh, then we put pipe, and then there's weight one, weight two, and you see the Brahmin and all that. We're going to go with weight one, which is cattle. Okay, so let's read the report. Okay, now in the meantime, you've been talking to your uh, uh, insurance agent, and you'll, you'll uh, work with them to get a, uh, uh, a contract. And uh, it's, it's about two pages. It's not a big deal. And then, depending on the relationship you have with him or her, uh, you'll probably, he'll, he or she will, she'll say, well, okay, you lock those cattle in, and then you've got to send me a check. And then it, that part's kind of specific. But here they are. So these are all the West Virginia, these are all the West Virginia quotes here. Counties, all counties, feeder cattle, yada, yada, yada. Okay, now, so, Here's the deal. This is the essence of this. We can buy a contract to mature in uh, June 7th, over here, the end date, June 7th. All right, that expected end value. Now, the expected end value is determined by sort of a play off of the futures market, and it, it, it talks about the, the futures activity, and options and puts and all of that thing, and they come, they arrive at this price, which grows in corn prices, uh, soybean prices, the whole works. So the experts say in those 13 states out west, those cattle in June are going to sell for $1.60. Now, keep in mind the basis between Oklahoma City and Morgantown, West Virginia. Okay. So it's going to be less than that. And quite frankly, what your cattle bring doesn't make any difference here. It has nothing to do with it. It's just there. You've locked into this. Now, okay, so they're going to say $1.60. Now you have different coverage levels. You can buy a policy for 99.6% of that. And that's at $4.90 per hundred. So that's kind of a risky deal out there. So you got 600 pound calves. All of a sudden, we're talking $30 to uh, to take a position in that. But you know, you manage your risk. Everyone manages it differently and has different needs. Maybe you're just trying to cover yourself against the uh, uh, disaster. Disaster. So here's the next option down for for June 7th. You say, well, the one sixty, but instead of 99. They go at 96, you know, not basically 97 percent, and that costs you two seven two dollars and seventy two cents. Six hundred pounder, twelve for sixteen dollars head on, just right at half. Or you can say, okay, uh, we'll go to 93 percent of the dollar sixty, and now we're talking about 93 cents a hundred, six hundred pounder, five dollars and forty cents keeps you in the market at $1.48. That's the essence of it. Why do you do that? Because things happen. Okay. Things, things happen. And I don't think anybody would want to insure on the top end of that. But I, I mean, there, there's a lot of opportunity there for that, to, uh, for that to change. Now, as you see here, there's three of these options on this particular day. But just yesterday I was on there, and this expected end value was $1.61. Well, so it's not that you want to shop this. It's like selling cattle out of the barn. You've got to know what you're comfortable with. You've got to know what they're worth. So right there it is. You can decide that. Now look at the July cattle. Now we're getting into here for people that are about to turn cattle out. So let's go to August. There's a good date for that. They're saying that these 600 pound calves will be $1.65 and you can buy 93% of that, of that money for 
for a, a dollar seventy eight cents a hundred. So six six dollars seven ten dollars and twenty five cents a head. Okay. Now, I don't care what you bring to your what you get for your cattle, but if that market drops and we know that there's a relationship, then you're going to get indemnified if it drops below the uh, the dollar fifty three, and you've you've squared all that with your uh, with your insurance agent, whether it's one steer or four hundred steers, you've you've done that. It's not a position in the futures market. This is an insurance policy, no more, no less. Then if you take the cattle farther into the year, they're up there at a dollar sixty nine. Can you believe we're talking about a dollar sixty nine cattle? Anyway, look at that. Now I do want to go back. I want to show you one thing because these are these are calves. Go back to the main menu. There's LRP again. Effective dates okay. I'm going to take. We'll just we'll just pretend it's from Alabama this time. Feeder cattle. Then, on type, I want to show you on the yearling cattle. Steers weight two. Now we'll create a report. The okay. These cattle weigh a little bit. These cattle weigh a little bit more. So, for those August cattle we talked about, these cattle average about seven fifty. And if they weigh seven fifty, we can guarantee a price of take a position at a dollar fifty. Ninety six percent of that. If they weigh 800 pounds, then 8.3, so we've got 24, $25 a head. But if we take 93% of that, or guarantee $1.39, we're talking $1.6884, so we're talking $12 a head. Well, that's a buck and a half, a hundred right there, and you've, you've locked that in. So what I suggest is you get that handout I gave you, Look on there and uh, get on this website and just just chart it. Now you can you can do it all at once. You can go uh, you can go back to uh, the main menu and uh, just change the effective date. You know uh, you can go back to a week ago and do the exactly the same thing just to see how it's trending. I suggest you do it every day. I strongly suggest you don't try to outsmart it because but I mean if it's trending up you know you you can you can attempt that here's feeder cattle and then we'll go type and and believe me you get on a computer on one end and give me a call and I'll help you on the other end but we're going to get to see now here they were they were slightly slightly lower so that's just something to keep in mind and uh, and follow that. You can sit down and better than that, get your kids or grandkids to it and have them write all that down for you or print that page or so you can and figure it out. But do there and get on every day, and then you'll begin. Then 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 my friends, you know just as much about the cattle business as anybody else, and that's a fact. Yes, sir. Okay, <coughs> I'd hate to see you tear out a man and hangs himself with his name tag. Uh, fall off, then you get right. into these. Uh, what your cattle bring? Not at November, and you don't. You, you drew a chart, but your cattle market, the one you're you're going to sell at this spring or this fall or whatever it is, is driven by those thirteen states. So what you get, if your cattle are better than everybody else's, and you get more than that, and the national market falls off, hey, you get her both ways. That's all. It's all about the beef industry itself and how that drives that. Okay. Or wherever you want to. Doesn't matter. Nope, I'm saying that insurance 
that insurance pays based on the, that average of those 13 states. I'm sorry, that's called, and I, I didn't show that, but I love it because it, it shows all these cattle everywhere, but it's the Chicago Mercantile Feeder Cattle Price Index. And you have trust me, friends, if you think it's in a large cattle sold out there, and it, lots of times it's 185,000 or more, stuff like that. Yes, sir. Yes. But or crabgrass and, and uh, fall fescue don't do well. Only an issue in the first couple of years. And So they're going to they're going to try to go productive regardless of the end of the campus. We can miss off. Regardless of national grazing management or severity of defoliation or anything else, they're going to try. We can still cut them off. 